Right, multi-tax on reserve prioritisation. Um, I just want to briefly, building on the last session, talk about um, how some of these methods can be used to um, do reserve prioritisation, in effect to, to, to identify areas in the landscape that should be um, preferentially you know, prioritised for, for conservation. Um, and this is really moving towards asking about can we actually um, use these models to predict distributions? Right, we've talked about this at, at length and we, we've already mentioned, you know, do we really want to be conserving areas where um, we're predicting the species might be but we don't really know that it is? Or do we really want to be, you know, investing conservation money in prioritising and building fences around, if you like, but conserving areas where we, you know, we, we have a pretty good idea that the species um, occurs. So it becomes more of a kind of interpolation challenge in terms of you've got these point occurrences, but what's the, you know, what's the area that those species are actually occurring in? And I'm not going to go through the full um, example. You can, you can read it, but I'm going to pick out some some things that are particularly relevant for, for us here. But building on a, a, a really nice paper that was published, uh, got the front, front cover of Science back in 2008. Claire Kremen and Alison Cameron were the, were the lead authors on this. Um, very cool, I think it's a, a Madagascan day gecko that, that, that was on the cover. But this was a study where they asked, well, can we use distribution modeling and reserve prioritization algorithms I'll mention again in a minute, to basically um, uh, build a, a recommendation as to which areas in Madagascar should be prioritised for conservation. And this was building on, um, I think it was back in 2004 maybe, the World Parks Congress, where there was, it, was, it was held in Durban and there was what was referred to as the Durban Vision, where the Madag Malagasy government basically made a promise or made a commitment to the international community that they were going to vastly increase the coverage of protected areas across, um, across Madagascar. Okay? So this, of course, set a big scientific challenge, if you like, to say, well, where should those reserves be? What are the areas that we should be prioritising where we will get the most conservation value for, you know, for a particular area of, of, of conservation. So for a particular area, how can we conserve the most species? Well, think we've just talked about the, the um, Wallaceian shortfall, that particularly in an environment like Madagascar, we often have very little information on where species are actually distributed. We often have just a few occurrence records. So they're asking, can we use distribution models or ecological niche models to start using those to, to, to identify the areas of distribution um, the actual distributions of the species that we can then use in a, a, a conservation prioritization exercise. So this was a very real challenge that was that was out there to, to you know what are the areas that we should we should preserve. So what did they do? So so this map that you're seeing is um, uh, the yellow areas are the protected areas back in 2002. Um, as of December 2006. Um, the blue areas were, I can't remember the exact details, but either kind of um, already identified that they will be implemented or they were actually already implemented, but they were kind of on, on the table already, the, the, the blue areas. And then the question was, you know, what's the kind of next step? It was going from something like um, 3 or 4% of the landscape will be protected, then kind of 2006 was 7 or 8%, but how can we actually up it to about 10% of the landscape? I don't remember the exact numbers, but you know it was in that kind of ballpark of, of a threefold or so increase in protected areas over what was available in the early 2000s. So the question was, well, well, well how, you know, what are the what are the next most important areas where we'll conserve the most species? Given that for most species we only get, know just a few occurrence records. So. They worked with um, 829 species. They worked with a whole bunch of um, different research groups and conservation organisations to get as many occurrence records as they can, as they could for that 829 species, each of which had at least seven occurrence records. That was the, that was the baseline minimum that they, that they set. 
as, as their minimum. I think that that's too few and they referenced a paper of mine to justify it, which I would disagree with, but that's, a, that's another story. They, they, they set a, a, a baseline, um, uh, you know, that, that's the minimum number of records that, that we need to, to, to build a useful distribution model. Um, they ran Maxent models. Uh, that was their model choice that they, that they justified um, presence-only methods, but you know exactly the same kind of stuff that you've that you've already seen. They generated a bunch of environmental data. They got all these occurrence records. They weren't doing it with a few dozen species like I did in the example that we just showed you. They were doing it with hundreds of species. But you'll see those of you who've run the methods, you know it's not it's not that difficult now to feed those all into the software, set it to run, and it might run overnight or it might just take a couple of hours. But you'll soon get results out for. 800 odd species. So they were their predictions of, of, of the species distributions. And then what they did was use those distributions within a reserve prioritization algorithm. The algorithm that they used was called zonation, but there were other ones out there. Um, they could have used like Marksan, some of you may have come across as is a kind of equivalent or, or, or a similar thing. Not Maxent, Marksan, different approach. Um, so these are basically methods that um, calculate through optimization algorithms. They calculate, well, well what's the best area that, we will con that, that will conserve the most species? You know, what, what's the optimum area in the landscape that we should um, prioritize because that will conserve the most species? But of course, you need to know the species distributions to feed in there. So essentially, they just ran a whole bunch of Maxent models and then fed those results into a reserve prioritization algorithm and they came up with a set of um, proposed areas, basically. And they did this in multiple ways. Again, I'm not going to go into the details here, but you, you'll see that in the paper in terms of how they did the prioritization. They just did it like, let's assume that we're just starting from scratch. Let's just prioritize the best areas. And what I'm showing you here is a bit more realistic. Let's, let's build on the areas that are already there. Let's try and extend the current network. Of, of areas. But this was, you know, their, their headline result and the, the idea was that this would be presented, be, you know, it was put before the Malagasy government and, 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 and the likes to actually try and influence um, the prioritization process. Of course, we'll emphasize that, that it's only one part of it. This is just based on the biology. So they weren't taking into account where um, there were particular mining interests or whether there were economic interests or where the populations were, the indigenous peoples and, and, and the like. It's just one part of the picture. But the, what they were trying to do is put on the table based on the best data that we have, based on our best knowledge of the biology and the best models that we can have, these are the areas that we think you should prioritise. Now, of course, we won't get into the politics, but back since this has all happened, the, 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 the situation in Madagascar has become difficult, shall we say. There's been, in effect, a coup and uh, the government has, has changed and this whole Durban vision has gone awry. Um, but you'll see the science behind what they were trying to do was put forward this. It's, it's straightforward. It, it build the distribution model exactly as we've learned. Feed it into another approach. Remember, we've talked multiple times and we will do again this afternoon about starting with the distribution models, they tell you some piece of information and then combining that with other approaches. We're going to talk about metapopulation models this afternoon, but in this case they, they, they combined it with a reserve prioritization algorithm. What I want to do for our purposes is just dig a little deeper into the distribution modeling side of things and ask a little bit about actually what the distribution models that were fed into the reserve prioritization were. And here's one example that I pinched from their um, supplementary materials. You know, materials that are kind of an appendix to, to, to the paper. So these are outputs from a Maxent model. And those of you who've run Maxent will see these are kind of the default colors and everything, the standard results that you get out of Maxent. I can't remember, embarrassingly, exactly what the species was, but that's not important here. You'll just about see, it's not terribly clear because of the, 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 the source that I had to pinch this from, um, these little white spots here, are, a couple down here as well, are the known occurrence records for this particular species. They did this for ants, butterflies, um, uh, amphibians, reptiles, use some of the data that, that, 
um, was from the Museum of Natural History in New York. Um, can't remember the exact species, but the little white spots that you can just about see are the, are the training points that we used to, 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 to build those models. So that's the probability surface, right? Well, they could have just used that. That was their prediction. Very similar to what we've been using for the previous example with accelerating the discovery of, 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 of species, right? Exactly the same. But then what they've done is said, well, this area up in the north, we've never found this particular species. It's disjunct from the known populations. We've no real reason to, to, to think that it's there. We certainly don't know that it's there. So we don't want to invest conservation money in um, preserving this species just because the habitat's suitable. So what they did was basically, this is what went into the model on the uh, right as you're looking at it. They clipped out, they cut out that whole northern area of suitable habitat and said, we don't know that the species occurs there, so we're not going to use that within our reserve prioritisation. They did that in practice by, and they experimented with various different ways. They took the known occurrence records. They did something along the lines of, they did a polygon around them, a minimum convex polygon. Imagine they're pins in a, in a sheet and you're stretching an elastic band around them. Right? So to get a polygon that encloses all of the points, minimum convex polygon. And they then buffered that by a little bit that was something to do with the dispersal some estimate of dispersal ability for the species. And then they kind of faded it a bit. They added a bit on where they reduced the probabilities until you reached zero. So they did it so that you came up with a nice um, kind of pretty looking map that, that doesn't have a, 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 a very angular edges to it. But in effect, what they did with some smoothing was draw a polygon around the known occurrence records and said anything outside where, you know, anything disjunct from where we've observed the species we're just going to clip out, clip being like a GIS type terminology for just remove it from, from the prediction. So this is a kind of type 3 prediction, right? That they're removing. They're not interested in it for this particular application. So if we think about that in the context of our diagrams that we've been working with, think I've presented you two case studies from Madagascar. Exactly the same kinds of approaches, using species distributions, few occurrence records, max scent models, environmental data, similar layers, temperature precipitations, remote sensing data, building the models, projecting them geographically onto the landscape. For our species discovery application, we were interested in the type three, in the type three predictions. That's all we clipped out, we ditched the rest. That's where we don't have any occurrence records. That's where we're going to go and look. The same models, in principle, exactly the same things, but for a different application, they were interested in, really particularly, this type 1 type, type 1 type, type 1 predictions. Just, you know, fitting around the known occurrence records. Anything outside that, they weren't interested in. And that was what they would then use for doing the reserve prioritization. So this is what we mean by you know, different interpretations of the models for different applications. And we talked about the semantics of a species distribution model versus an ecological niche model. Well, it is kind of just semantics, but in, in another respect, what this reserve prioritization study was doing was really running distribution models. They wanted the models to tell them something about the distributions. Whereas in our approach for looking at species discovery, trying to go and sample in new environments that aren't inhabited, it's really an ecological niche model. We're interested in what's the potential distribution, where is the ecological niche of the species. And neither's right or wrong, but they're very different interpretations and applications of exactly the same method. And think as well about the evaluation approaches that we've used and our difficulties and discussions about what an absence record is, particularly with these type 3 predictions, it's going to affect how we want to evaluate the models as well. So same models, but very different applications. And as usual, some key, um, key references. <coughs>